what we've done for previous uh, sessions is had newbies who haven't been uh, in these discussions before briefly introduce themselves just a few sentences but i'm i'm getting uh i'm getting uh lame enough i'm not even sure who, who who's in, who's a newbie this time so if, if if anyone is new and hasn't been here before you're welcome to identify yourself or not this is uh, brett martinson speaking um <laughs> i'm an agi researcher been doing ai research for 53 years now your, uh, your name yeah. your name is familiar yeah either either we've met yeah. or i've read a paper of yours or something yeah, yeah ran into you at the uh, agi conferences there we go yeah. yeah yeah for sure and uh i've been doing this agi research for as i say 53 years i got a website uh it's called adaptron inc oh, yeah. com and uh got a cognitive architecture built out of uh binary neurons or i call them binons and i've been using it for pattern recognition handwritten digits uh, i use it for morse code recognition i've got it uh being used to control uh, a simulated robot running around in a maze so and i'm currently writing a book about all the uh, uh the ideas of the cognitive architecture cool all right any other newbies here yeah i'm a newbie you are. Hi, everyone. So I'm James. Uh, I've been working with Matt and Debbie on our COVID simulations for about the past year. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, I've not seen your face before, actually, but, I, but I've, uh, I've seen your, your name on emails. Cool. Right. I'm, uh, I'm a research affiliate at the SETI Institute, and I'm also a research associate with SingularityNet, where we're trying to finally uh, present a solution to the gray goo problem uh, in order to try and make some progress in terms of shifting the Overton window for advanced molecular nanotechnology. So, uh, yeah, it's nice to be here. Nice to see you all. All right. Well, great. Yeah. Great to have some, uh, some new faces. So, you know, the, these AGI discussion, uh, sessions are still fairly, uh, experimental and, uh, we haven't tried something quite like this uh, before these last few sessions. There's a bit of a, a gray area in the definition of the sessions and that we're, we're clearly biasing toward things that are vaguely related to an open cog and open cog hyper on type approach, but I'm not trying to construe that too too narrowly so d just as uh you know you could say at, at uh google deep mind they're centered around deep reinforcement learning and loosely brain emulation type approaches but they are they're also doing doing a bunch of other things in, in that in that periphery so and uh, additionally we're sort of experimenting with some sessions that are more lecture oriented and uh, focused on highly specific ideas and then discussing and understanding them. And the next session two weeks from now is going to be like that. So Jonathan uh, Worrell will be talking about some, some issues related to uh, dependent modal types and, and probabilistic types and how these relate to AGI. And uh, I've asked Jonathan to give, give a talk on that and then we, then we can discuss afterwards. And that, that's work that I've found inspirational for our own work on the, the Atomese language, which will get a new name at some point. And the Atomese uh, in, 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 interpreter for, for Hyperon. Now, for for today, I didn't make any slides and then have a highly formal presentation. So I'm gonna I'm gonna introduce a theme and then open it up for discussion. Leave leave it a bit looser. And I think we're we're gonna do some looser and some more tightly focused sessions and sort of see what see what seems to everyone to be working out best and uh, adapt as we go and try try to 
try to be a, a collective general intelligence about about all this. So the the theme for today is emergence versus uh, engineering, for lack of a better way to phrase it, in in AGI architectures. So what do you what aspects of cognition or memory or perception or other cognitive functions do you explicitly wire into your AGI system versus what parts do you assume the AGI system is going to emerge in 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 the course of you know acting according to simpler dynamics in in in, in interaction with the world. So what, what, what do you need to code in? And of, of course, this is a vexed question through the whole history of, of AI and those views all over the spectrum, right? So, I mean, then that historical, somewhat overblown dichotomy in the AI field between symbolic and sub-symbolic methods was somewhat about that, right? In symbolic AI methods, you're assuming that you're wiring in things like, say, the notion of a variable or a or a combinator, and the the notion of a function with arguments, or a, the 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 notion of a quantifier binding. So you're you're programming these things in as a as a developer and designer. Whereas folks making, say, any kind of neural net based AI system. If they're aiming at human level AGI, then that means they're aiming to create an AI that eventually will learn to manipulate quantifiers and, and, and variables because everyone who is taking a logic class has learned to do that, right? But they're but that they're, they're assuming that that capability is going to emerge somehow through the coordinate activity of a of a whole bunch of of neurons. And that, that's a you can look at that in all sorts of different aspects, right? So say the hierarchical structure that is built into deep neural models now and deep neural vision models, or you have a hierarchical structure that specifically correlates with the hierarchical structure of, of the what's coming in from, from a camera, of, of the, the, the visual plane. So you have things like max pooling, layers in, in your hierarchical structure. So you're building that in. Analogous to how that's wired into the visual cortex by evolution. But do you do you have to build that in, right? Could you build a more undifferentiated network with a sort of heterogeneous structure and have the hierarchy, if that's the best way to do things, have the hierarchy self-organized? I mean, of course you can do that, right? Like, so in in a genetic algorithm with the search over neural structures, you can use evolution to evolve not just the best neural net, but the best neural structure for a certain problem. And a system like that should be able to figure out that a hierarchical network with a hierarchy corresponds to the hierarchy of regions of different sizes of an input image. The, the evolutionary algorithm should figure out that that sort of hierarchy gives the best kind of network for doing vision processing, right? And I, I remember some work by someone or other a couple of decades ago showing that uh, you didn't need to tell your AI algorithm that space is three-dimensional, right? Because you just give it a stream, one-dimensional stream of values over time. And, you know, it can implicitly explore various potential dimensionalities for that stream. And if you if you assume it's three dimensions, right, then then there's a lot more patterns in that data than if you assume it's two or four dimensions, right? And and so then you assume, well, this one dimensional stream comes from a from a three dimensional world. Now, human brain doesn't quite do that, although we take two paired two dimensional streams and then we reconstruct a three dimensional world. So we have in our brain we have some things wired in and some things that emerge, and we don't wholly know what they are, right? Because <laughs> because we don't understand the brain that well. We know some things. We know that the hierarchy of the visual world is 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 wired in. We know that three dimensionality 
in a way is is at least partly substantially wired in though we learned some aspects of, of reconstructing the 3d world we don't know whether quantifier bindings are, and functions and arguments are wired in to the human brain or or, or not right now we we will discover that i guess in the next couple of decades we do we do know these things are not wired into evolution right so i mean evolution as a general intelligence has figured out all this stuff and and bakes it into the into the human brain but that doesn't mean that 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 the brain uh, that, that doesn't mean that the brain has to learn learn all these things so i think at a philosophical level the answers to this question are are all over the map now within within our work on OpenCog and, and Hyperon, we've always been mixing up engineering and emergence in, in complex ways and in confusing ways that have even confused us and, and, and uh, everyone working with us in, 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 in various occasions, partly because in OpenCog, we have a quite general fabric right so you have the atom space which is this weighted labeled hypergraph or metagraph really this weighted labeled meta typed metagraph then we have multiple ai algorithms acting upon that which are reading and writing from that from that metagraph in a sort of collaborative way and then they need to synergize with and cooperate with each other rather than stepping on each other's toes and so that's uh that sort of framework can be used in a lot of different ways, right? So that, that that sort of framework, you could build a neural net in that framework, or you could build a cellular automaton, you could build all manner of you know, discrete or continuous dynamical systems. It wouldn't necessarily be the most efficient way to implement those things. It will be an interesting way to implement those things. So I, I outlined in a blog post some time ago, years ago, which we'll do a discussion session focusing more on that sometime, a, a blog post called Cogistry, Cognitive Chemistry on OpenCog Brainwave blog, where, where I was, I was discussing, you know, how would you, how would you do the evolution of a sort of prebiotic soup of interacting, intermodifying programs in, in the OpenCog atom space. So you're using, you, it, that was inspired by Walter Fontana's alchemy program from the 1990s, where he had a bunch of Lisp codelets that rewrote other Lisp codelets and to get other Lisp codelets and a sort of Lisp codelet soup, right? So I was exploring how would you do that in the... Uh... Yeah, Ke Adam Vandervert just typed uh, in the chat. That sounds like Chem Lambda. Yeah, I mean, alchemy, I believe, long predated either Chem Lambda or... or or my own uh, pub publications on this. And Fontana, who's a very interesting guy, has since gone more in the direction of explicit biological models of proteomic networks and so forth. So yeah, Chem Lambda and Cogistry, Cognitive Chemistry, they're both AGI approaches like alchemy in the direction of, uh, you know, a soup of program fragments that are rewriting other program fragments. And I mean, that that's, that's, an approach to AGI, which is highly emergence focused. Some things also are not emergent there. Like, for example, you assume some programming language that's 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 baked in there for the codelets to use initially in, in, in rewriting each other. And another system much in that direction is Replicode, which is part of the ERA, A-E-R-A system to come out of Kristen Thorson's lab in, uh, in Iceland, which is very, very, very interesting. And they they got like a soup of intermodifying, interproducing replicode fragments to control a humanoid robot in the Humanobs project that was uh, funded by the by the EU for for some time. So if you look up replicode and era from Chris Kristen Thorson in Iceland, that's amazing stuff in a roughly similar vein to Chem Lambda and uh, and uh, Cogistry, I'd say. Replicode and Era, they're actually implementing a new version of, of Replicode now. That, that's, I think, more 
advanced in implementation and experimentation than Chem Lambda possibly. And Cogus Free was just an idea. We never implemented it. But my point was in, in the open cog framework, you can implement something like that that's really fully self self-organization based, right? On on the other hand, my colleagues and I have built a bunch of practical commercial systems on the on the open cog framework such as uh say uh information extraction engine for uh documents written by some uh u.s government employees we built in in 2004 or so and when we built or in the context of a hedge fund uh, idea that i was working with 10 7 to 10 years ago i mean we, we were we were using open cog for some aspects of financial prediction. So when we use OpenCog Fabric for applications like this, we weren't relying heavily on, on emergence. I mean, we were we were wire, wiring in a, a, a lot of things relative to that application. We were for, so for doing natural language processing applications with OpenCog, we were just, we were hard coding little procedures for, you know, mapping linguistic quantifiers like sum into Qualified logic expressions, and we just coded those because that was useful for the for the application, right? And uh, we we coded some subsampling algorithms that that were useful for for dealing with predictive models in a machine learning context. So there, using that same OpenCog fabric, we did some very some things with a lot of hand engineering, which are not so AGI oriented. Actually, it, it, it's more just using OpenCog infrastructure to build narrow AI systems, which get a little bit of extra power from the flexibility that comes from using an AGI oriented framework. So OpenCog as a system could be used either for totally emergent like stuff or for stuff that's heavily, heavily based on hand engineered stuff that's even not so much AGI, but narrow AI. Now in, in our, our attempt to work toward AGI with OpenCog, there's also a mix of engineered stuff with emergent stuff, which is is something that is there to be experimented with and and played with to 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 an extent. I mean, we we were deciding what cognitive algorithms to put in there, right? So, I mean, if we if we're if we're connecting to a deep neural net for vision processing, we're deciding that initially. The AI is not deciding that, and uh, we're putting a lot a logic engine in there, say PLN logic engine, which has some link types like inheritance link and and similarity link and some basic rules like a deduction rule and induction rule, and we're decide we're deciding that, and we're deciding that there is a deduction and induction rule in there. On the other hand. This is where things start to get experimental is we, I mean, it's all experimental. This is where things start to get even more, even, even more experimental. You know, we, uh, we have a truth value formula associated with each logic rule in PLN logic engine. So say we, we, we have a deduction truth value rule and then deduction truth value formula that, de that deals with the quantitative truth value formula. So if, if you know, like, Ben is American and Americans are silly. You can derive therefore Americans are silly with a certain probability. But if Ben is American to degree 0.8 and Ben is silly to degree 0.9, then to what degree is, is Ben estimated to be silly by that deductive inference? So there's a quantitative formula that, that makes that quantitative deductive inference. So Originally, we hard coded that formula. You know, Matt Eclay and I and others wrote a book going over math for deriving the the probabilistic truth value formulas here in probabilistic logic networks. Now, Alexei Potapov and some of his team in, in St. Petersburg wrote a paper a couple years ago on you know using learning to learn the quantitative truth value formulas to be used with PLN logic. So, I mean, then you would, you would just pose as a learning problem. Like what's the, what's the optimal 
what's the optimal truth value formula to go with the to go with the PLN deductive rule based on the quality of inferences obtained by by applying the rule, right? So that, that that's that's the case where within our would be AGI paradigm we're following to try to build an AGI on, on, on open cog. There's some things that are assumed to be wired in, like the fact that we're using a probabilistic logic as one of the tools to update the atom space, and the fact that that probabilistic logic has a deduction rule working on inheritance links. But then the question of the truth value update formula to go with the to go with the uh, deduction rule, like we knew we knew that is cognitive content. We always intended that eventually the system should update itself, update that rule. But the question is, I mean, how how important is that? Can you can you code that rule and leave it fixed until the system gets to human general intelligence level, and then then let it modify that rule, or is updating that rule sort of part of the ongoing you know cauldron of of self modification processes that that gets you to general intelligence? And that that particular thing. I'd say it's an open research question within within OpenCog. We could we could try both ways, and there's a shitload of such open open research questions, right? So I mean, with with natural language processing, there's a there's a whole bunch also, right? So predicate argument structure or quantifiers and and quantifier bindings that. At some level, we're building those in, in the sense that we're building an assemblage of node and link types, which is, we know is capable of, of serving as a very robust intuitionistic logic. On the other hand, how natural language expressions map into this vocabulary of node and link types. In some prior narrow AI systems built in OpenCog, we wired that in, but that's clearly wrong from an AGI perspective, right? I mean, you, you, you certainly, you certainly need to have the mapping from language expressions into into a, a logical formalism. If there is a logical formalism, if that is explicitly engineered rather than emergent, you certainly need to you certainly need to have that learned, right? So I, I guess in our own work. There's a mix of mechanisms that we're wiring in with choices like an inheritance link or a similarity link that don't necessarily have to be wired in, but we're choosing to do so so far. And then things that need to emerge in the in the network as a as a whole, right? And inference control is another example of something that I think has to emerge, and at least in our framework, we're we're assuming that so we can. Let's say you have a logic. Well, how do you choose which logic rules to enact? Well, that's the inference control problem. Certainly, you can make some simple inference control heuristics. Like if, if a certain sequence of inference rules in a certain context has never yielded a useful conclusion, don't do it very often, right? So you can do some basic probabilistic learning for inference control. But we need like we need a whole artillery of subtle heuristics for for inference control, and you know, to get so many interesting heuristics for inference control, these have to be just learned by doing inference in a bunch of, of contexts and applying various learning algorithms to the problem of, of learning how to infer in different contexts. And then the, the inference control heuristics, they have to cooperate and, and work together. You have an emergent network of inference, inference control heuristics, right? So there's a, th these are a few of the ways We've danced around this issue in OpenCog. I mean, it's and we're not done with that yet, right? So it's it's clear that you know if, if you're taking a network-based approach to mind, then the mind network it has structures at, at lower, intermediate, and high levels, which all need to emerge. And when cognitive processes occurring in this network-based system. A lot of what happens is conditioned by this network of, of emergent structures. And this has to include some emergent hierarchies, some emergent heterarchies, some emergent sort of prebiotic program soups like, like, like you have in an alchemy type thing. Like there has to be all this that emerges. But how much is wired in to catalyze this emergence is an open question. And there's there's two 
two general misconceptions I want to call out before opening up to everyone else to, to ramble and rant to their own their own heart's content. So the 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 first the first which is not made so much anymore, but in a lot of my career, which is not as long as Brett Martinson's, but it's still multiple decades long, right? And the, so, since the late eighties or so I've been I've been working on this stuff and thinking about it since the late seventies. One misconception that used to be made a lot is that the human brain lets almost everything emerge and is sort of like a blank slate neural network out of everything, out of which intelligence sort of crystallizes by, by pure learning. And people assume that about the brain quite a lot. Now it's almost swung to the opposite direction because we have these deep neural nets with a very rigid hierarchical structure and you know, a lot of specifics to how they're engineered. And people assume that that the brain is like that. So I think it's even swung even swung the, the op opposite way. And there's a presumption in some circles that the brain is less fluid and, and, and self-organizing than, than it really is. But I mean, my, my mother's partner lost 30% of her brain in a car accident and after two years regained essentially all functions, right? So, I mean, the, the missing parts of the brain, all their functions were reconstituted in, in the remaining part, which is, which is amazing medical miracle that practical neurologists don't understand now, right? But it illustrates the ability for self-organization that that exists in, in, in the brain. And I'm sure her brain doesn't do all those things the same way it did before the car accident, which was 20, 20 years ago, right? So the point is the brain is a big, complex, messy, weird thing that's very partially understood. And there's a lot of wiring in of specifics in there, like particular parts of language processing system where if you get a lesion in that part of the brain you can't conjugate verbs or something in there right so i mean that there and that holds for everybody so there there's there's a lot of highly specific wiring in of stuff in the brain in sometimes weird ways there's also clearly a lot of self-organization and, and emergence of structures that happens both in the the fetal stage of development and during during the first few years of life and to some extent throughout our lives. So the, those are both there and we just don't understand the, the balance, right? And the second misconception I call out gives me an, an excuse to uh, briefly rag on a recent paper by, by, by DeepMind. So the, the second misconception I wanna call out is just because a certain AGI approach could lead to AGI in theory with sufficient resources doesn't mean it's a practical way to, to lead to AGI. And you know how this came up with DeepMind recently is, you know, the, 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 there was a paper from Richard Sutton and colleagues. And I, I love Richard Sutton, by the way. He's a great innovator and a brilliant thinker and such a, such a wonderful human being too. But th this paper is, uh, reward is enough, right? And uh, I guess in the in the in the spirit of attention is all you need. And the thing is, there's a couple issue, issues with that. The argument being reinforcement learning, the the claim being reinforcement learning is enough to get AGI, right? So I mean, one one issue is it's not incredibly well defined. I mean, reinforcement learning is very vague, and if you construe it broadly enough, it, you could make it include almost almost everything so a lot of things are enough if you're willing to redefine what they are as you as you discover what's what's actually enough then it's just that that label in human informal discourse which is enough but i, I think the other issue there is there's a conflation perhaps of something being enough to lead to agi given a sufficiently abundant amount of resources and a sufficiently long period of time versus something being sufficient to lead to human level AGI in a practical amount of time and resources, right? Because it there are interesting senses in which reinforcement learning is enough to get to massively superhuman AGI given sufficient time and resources. And of course, Marcus Herder's AXE work basically showed that, right? I mean, that, that is reinforcement. It's reinforcement learning meets statistical decision theory and algorithmic information theory. So that, I mean, that's that's not exactly the line Sutton is taking, but I mean, that, that's, uh, 
that's one way of arguing that 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 it it it, it, it is enough. I mean, you can you can argue maybe it's not enough by looking at weird scenarios where reward maximization in itself screw screw screws you up in in, in terms of deceptive ways of manipulating an agent's reward function or something. But but the point I want to make here isn't that. It's that something being enough in principle doesn't get you very far. Like evolutionary learning is is enough, right? You could use evolutionary learning to to create arbitrarily complex systems almost obviously because you're if you're evolving a program in a turn complete language with random mutations, I mean eventually you'll explore the program space. So so it, it, it's enough if you're not worried about how fast it goes or how big the memory has to be. And that was interesting in the 1950s and 60s. I don't think it's interesting anymore because we understand too well now there's a shitload of ways to make turn complete representations. There's a shitload of in principle, in principle, you know, omnipotent learning mechanisms that are, are stochastic and, and take a really long time. And that's sort of a textbook thing. It's good to know that. No, but it doesn't get us there. And the same certainly is true of pure emergence approaches to AGI, like letting almost everything emerge and keeping the AI's, AGI's computational fabric. That's definitely enough to get to AGI, just like reinforcement learning is enough. I would say pure emergence in a like self-organizing chemical type or cellular automaton type network that might even be enough in a stronger sense than than reinforcement learning, like because that's enough to manifest, you know, David Weinbaum's concept of open-ended in, in, in intelligence, where an intelligence is concerned not just with achieving a reward function, but with, you know, modifying and growing itself and and its environment and the interaction between itself and its environment in unpredictable ways. So clearly. Pure emergence is enough, but the question of whether it's enough in actual practice, given practical amounts of time and resources, is is less clear. And then, to me, the question becomes more of a balance: like, what 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 is it most sensible to engineer in versus to leave to leave to emerge in practical AGI contexts? I mean, given in the long run, if we get a massively superhuman AGI with full self-modification capability, okay, it may move on. A, it may engineer stuff in its own mind that we haven't even dreamed of. B, it may move on to emergence in ways that that we that we can't even imagine. But to get to get to that level of human level AGI, how do you balance engineering versus emergence of various factors? You know what what goes into your knowledge representation versus into your meta representation which is a representation of the learning engine that learns knowledge re knowledge representations so that's a big confusing topic and really hyperom we're intending to be a playground to to explore that topic as as we we move toward hopefully getting to to agi but i'm i'm curious how others have have confronted this issue in in their own work and thinking And I've got to take a rest or I'm going to get laryngitis. So someone else has to say something. I'd like to talk about sister a little bit. <laughs> sure, why not? Okay. Sister, I mean, I I already know about sister, but uh, but not not everybody does. So I mean, we and we should we should do one of these discussion sessions purely on on sister and your ideas with cultural oh, cool. for AG, okay. for AGI, actually. I mean, that's uh, that, that, that that's another very cool approach which is emergence focus so yeah yeah that, yeah it. it's emergent focus right um and so um the idea is um you can hold uh many you can hold something still in sister for example i have um uh a simulation where um agents are uh farmer agents and they uh, need all the four food groups. Um, but um, but another thing I hold still is the more um, effort they put into uh, making 
a single food group, the more they have of it. So I set it up. So trade is, um, trade is to their advantage, but then they have to learn the rest, right? And so from just a few facts uh, that they need all four food groups and um, there's economies of scale that, that if they concentrate their efforts, they can do better. Um, just these few facts emerges, um, a division of labor, um, a standard of trade, which is some of these goods come to be a money, um, a price for those. Um, and um, recipes for um, different combinations of goods that are more satisfying, right? And so from these recipes, from these recipes, um, uh, you can uh, almost um, open-endedly um, uh, satisfy your needs for the four food groups, right? Because there's there's a, almost an infinite amount of different ways to satisfy your needs more. So in this case, I've held a few things still and let things emerge. And the, I, the way that this emerged is the idea of institutions, that agents can, um, agents can make, uh, the agents choose each other based on um, a symbol. For example, um, I may be a farmer that has berries extra berries and I need milk. And then there's another farmer who has extra milk and needs berries. And it, they, they label themselves with a symbol and they seek a symbol. And so there's a double induction on a symbol and that's came to be known as a tag. Um, and because of this double induction on that symbol, um, when they, each having their own genetic algorithm in their head, uh, make a trade uh, with a person of that symbol, then they associate that symbol with that trade. And so that can complexify because once they associate this symbol with the trade, then other agents can get into it in the future because um, the they do not identify each other as individuals, but by that symbol. And so a symbol comes to mean a trade. And once you have that, and that's just a, a kind of a memory, then that symbol can change a little bit and get to be a little bit of a different trade. And so like say um, a new agent coming into the simulation uh, who doesn't know anything and he displays symbol nine, right? Then suddenly, uh, let's say that symbol nine is for a recipe that that the agents have created for succotash. And um, then a lot of agents come to him and try to sell him the ingredients of succotash. And then a lot, a lot of agents also come to him buying the, the ingredients, buying succotash. And so if that agent can, um, so that agent has selective pressure to make succotash a certain way. However, he still has a flexibility to change succotash and make a better succotash and change his symbol. And so that's how the society evolves. Um, and so, so I see as basic the fact, the institutions, which are the symbol system, the, a system of symbols that um, are closer, farther to each other, and that scaffold no, new agents into the system so that they begin to understand um, what, who they are by how people interact with them and the fact that we can have new agents, that this is a way to have a complexification. And this, um, in the Singularity Net project, I use this sister system to um, have arbitrary Python programs um, created because every agent uh, uh, can pick a, a Python program from a repository and as it is expressed in um, purring, purried language um, and has a symbol, then the, the symbol that they display and read uh, to buy programs from each other construct arbitrary Python programs. 
and those become new programs in the registry. And that's on the Singularity Nets site now. And what we used it for is um, to create, uh, uh, to do an auto ML for um, unsupervised learn things, which don't have a really good test like supervised learn things do. For example, a good clustering system. And the way this works is we have many, the idea is there are if there are many demands for different programs in the system, like human beings wanting different types of things, the system, um, the agents in the system can be scaffolded through the same process that those farmer agents were scaffolded, that they start to display and read signs and that those those signs come to in the in the whole society have a meaning of a, a certain set of requirements for programs. Like for example, um, it, since we're making a cluster, um, you know, is this cluster the kind that is best for this type of text or that type of text? And then if you have more demands in the system, like also I want to use that cluster and I want to use it in a simulation that needs um, polarized agents, right? So those polarized, um, the need for the polarized agents, um, if, if you take uh, like social media text and cluster it, and you see it clusters into um, uh, uh, right wing and left wing statements, right? And if it does that correctly and it makes the polarized agent simulation work better, then, um, then that puts selective pressure through the signs of how of, of the kind and group of the kind of clusters we want. So the ontology emerges and because the ontology emerges and because there's selective pressure and scaffolding of agents, um, the agents can complexify and make uh, better things gradually. So, and this goes back to Alexei's um, um, ideas about OpenCog that, oh, well, there's some um, functions you can learn, right? Um, because it's useful for something, right? And so that's, that's how Sister works. If you put in more things that for useful for a variety of things, then individual agents are pressured to uh, become more general, right? And so that, that is how we get to a more general program or a better program is a program that can function in a lot of different contexts. And so it has a lot of, and some of like, it might have easier problems that is more, um, that it, it becomes good at. And then it's, uh, it's pre, pre it's already pre-adapted. So De Debbie, how do you, how do you see this as, I mean, I I, and I I feel I have an unfair advantage because I've been hearing you talk about this since whenever yeah, I don't it was. Know if I'm making sense or not? <laughs> and, no, I mean it makes sense to me, but I've known about this network of ideas since like 2002 when we first. Just, I, I have no idea if, if if anyone understands me or not. That's why I have changed. Well, it would be it would be great if you uh, post some links to your work on this in 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 the chat actually, so others can. Okay, others okay, can I'll do that. But, what I wanted to ask is, how do you see abstract knowledge representation emerging in this kind of network? So one, one sort of threshold that's often occurred to me in working with logical AI systems is scolum functions, like depend quantifier bindings via, via which an extensionally quantifying variable maps to which which other quantified variables it, it, it depends on right because you can mm -hmm. you can go a long way without without that but in the end like we 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 do have that kind of representation we have things that that are that are implicitly doing that right so i mean you it's pretty easy to see how you get something like propositional logic with variables and different arguments to emerge from sister or from a whole bunch of, of other kinds of cool self-organizing networks. And then of course, you know, universal 
quantification and existential quantification are a lot are a lot like uh, or and end. So it's easy to see how you get some basic predicate logic ish stuff, which could be in a term logic type format or something, to 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 kind of emerge in the, in a bottom up way. Then, and similar with neural networks, there's a there's a bunch of neural networks that have been trained in in various ways to do propositional logic type stuff. Now where where things get confusing is when you go in logic to nested quantifiers with non-trivial quantifier dependencies. And this is also when things get complicated when you're in a in the dependent type sort of sort of framework and you and you 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 need to do you need you need to do analog of quantifier dependencies in, in your type system. And this is where you run up against different ways of doing it in classical logic or different intuitionistic logics and the corresponding type systems. And it's not that clear to me how you get a neural net to learn this sort of quantification without cheating a little bit and like biasing the network to learn that. I mean, I, I wrote a paper on this in 2015 or something, in some, in, which was given at some conference in Beijing, where I showed, in theory, you could get there using a formalism of neural nets that take vectors encoding the internals of other neural nets as, as, as inputs, basically. So you, t you, you, you take a neural net and then you, you're mapping its whole connection matrix into a vector. Then you're able to feed that vector as, as input into another neural net. And then uh, in that way, like in that, that way you can get, in that way you get the, basically you can rebuild combinatory logic and then you can get the U combinator and you can, you can, you can rebuild a formalism that's equivalent to quantifier bindings. But on the other hand, when you open things up to that level of self-reference where like the projection of a neural net into a vector is the input to another neural net, like you, yes, you can express anything that way, be, but mm -hmm. also the search space becomes ridiculously big, right? right? Okay. So, the, the, so okay. the, I guess, and in, in OpenCog at the moment, we're sort of punting on that, right? Like we, we are building yeah. in nodes and links. We are building in nodes and links that are equivalent to some form of like intuitionistic quantifier logic. Still an intuition for what these things mean and how to use them has to, has to emerge, emerge in the system, right? So you can't, you right. can't really wire in all the inference control heuristics there. So I, I guess what I'm wondering okay. is in, in the sister world, how, how would how would your agents get there? Okay, um, well, well uh, first of all, I'd like to say that the purpose of sister is to make an objective social science and to simulate society and emulate, emulate the, uh, to observe and emulate societies recreate the um, feedback loops in those societies of the institutions so that policy can be tested on it. So the purpose is objective social science. It's not really AGI. However, I'm saying also that um, sister um, can be an AGI because society is an AGI. And a lot of times AGI doesn't look at the social theoretically backed up uh, relations that create intelligence in human beings because human intelligence is created in society and in language and in institutions, right? Um, and so that's the angle I'm getting at it at. And I see, um, I don't know that much about logic, so um, let me guess what you're talking about, that um, about the scholium that, um, you, what you're saying is in the fact in genetic programming that it's hard to say you're talking about the same thing in one part of the code as the other and identify that as the same thing and so have that same thing well, I, I, I think the the analog the analog roughly speaking an analog in the programming language side would be how do you get to fully recursive programs beyond just primitive recursive okay programs? okay so um, I think that question, I see these kinds of recursions like as 
as hacks. Okay, but they're wonderful hacks, right? Like um, in evolution, um, maybe well, that, a, that, that describes that describes all of human intelligence. Right, so. right, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. But they're wonderful little tricks, right? Um, for example, um, uh, how did the human mind uh, uh, advance in? and take a great leap in, in, in advancement and at different stages in evolution. And one thing is the theory of mind where um, like a tiger might be crouching because, you know, it has learned and it has the instinct to crouch, but it doesn't have the sight of himself in, in the mind of the deer, right? And, and at some point in evolution, when he got that ability to see himself in the mind of the deer, well, the tigers don't have it, but when people got that, then, then there was a great leap that um, that was very efficient and it could perform all of these things, right? All of these um, crouching and every kind of hiding posture, not just uh, learning them all separately, right? So then uh, we came to know a truth, right? And uh, by coincidence, we have a great leap that we got a theory of mind. Well, it seems like this thing you're talking about, which is, um, uh, Sorry, still, I'm, I'm thinking of it as, you know, having the same thing um, and having a genetic programming reference the same thing in different parts and and recursing and recursing and getting out of that and knowing that's what you were talking about. That's like a great leap, right? The, the ability to recurse, just like the theory of mind is a kind of recursion, right? I'm thinking about you, you think about me, I'm thinking about you. <laughs> so, so, um, once you get one of the, those hacks, the ability to curse, which is really not a complicated set of code, um, then you have that. And in Sister, of course, um, uh, even the, the one I'm working on with James with our, our paper for the AGI conference, you know, I, I told him, well, you can uh, learn certain things. You know, it's all the parameters for the simulation are learnable, the one that you're using for that, right? Um, so as long as we have this registry of, and, and it's actually possible now because we have a registry of programs that are, um, that are created in sister and they're not different from the registry of programs that are initialized in sister. So they, they're free to choose from the created registry and the initial registry and the sister program itself could be in the initial registry and it could be, you know, recreated through the sister process into the created registry. So that would be an example of a leap, you know, programming yourself because um, uh, it's already a, uh, having the, uh, your own program that you're writing is that's- well, so, where, so where that gets tricky, I think is, as you know, from genetic programming and automatic programming of all kinds, Mm -hmm. What is simple code depends completely on what your programming language is, right? So, I mean, if certainly recursion is really simple code, if your language allows recursion, Recur recursion in like COBOL is really not simple code and uh, emulating recursion in Fortran is a, is a little simpler, but I mean, you need an explicit, an explicit stack, right? So then how, how is the stack and the learning of that stack emerged? So I mean, if you, if if the line, if you're using Lisp, then evolving recursion is 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 straightforward, which is part of the, part of the beauty of it. So I guess I th I guess that that comes back to the uh, emergence versus and and engineering theme, right? Because in, uh -huh. well, in automated, it, it relates to something we discussed in the previous session with like automated program learning using genetic programming to learn sorting algorithms is really easy. Like, for example, if if you have a merge primitive in your language, then you can learn merge. Yeah. Primitive. It's very it's very short program. But having the system like self organizing that merge primitive is, is, is an issue. So the, I guess the question is if if you have like a base language that doesn't have the right kinds of recursion baked into the language, then it may it may not be straightforward for for 
full on recursion, yeah. being like the Curry Howard correspondent of uh, of quantifier binding to 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 work, right? So that's I mean, uh, I so I'm. I'm I'm not actually seeing at the moment how Sister is any any better or worse off than than, than OpenCog. It's it's in, okay, in this okay. way. I, I need to look at I need to look at your problem. I didn't I didn't know. Before. Yeah 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 yeah. I know we, 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 we this is um, random. This is this is an emergent conversation which was yeah, not yeah, engineered. Yeah. So, right? Sorry so, about that, but um um well you see I do use well, it, it is a discussion right. forum. It's supposed to be right, an emergent right. conversation. Ooh. Yeah yeah. <laughs> I, I do I do use current now, right? I have like a more general form of a program and it gets more specific as parameters are filled in. And it, you know, it starts out like, you know, AI programs, clusters, uh, clusters made by, you know, Jensen uh, with, with five clusters. And then, you know, and all the parameters are in this genetic string, right? So the language is, and you, it, it just has a how occurring way to specify a, a program generally or specifically. And then one agent can say it generally and the other agents can specifically fill those in. And then that becomes an emergently made program because they can put those programs on top of each other and using uh, GAP, um, genetic expression programming, you know, there can be a tree that interprets those. But then there's a sign, and that sign, um, which which they use to choose the programs, um, uh, has an implicit um, requirements for that program in it. Because basically, if you don't meet the implicit requirements that the sign mean that the sign indicates, you're not going to get rewarded, right? And so that implicit sign, that's the part that comes to have meaning. But there's an explicit Howard there's a explicit occurring that, that in which programs are expressed. And that's any program that you initialize and you put in your registry to begin with. And then those programs are combined um, and then put into the made, created program registry. And then agents can choose from any of those programs to add on the program. So those programs that are put in the registry can in, include the program that is running <laughs> right and if you could could replace it and so that was a kind of way i was getting at recursion you know that, that not the way that uh you would um uh, it, right now if the language if there's a language of recursion there uh in in the programs in and i can call that program right and so i am cheating but um but but I'm emphasizing the institutions and the emergent ontology that forms. That's that's the emphasis. And is saying that because I have this emergent ontology, which implicitly uh, says a requirement list and that can get arbitrarily long uh, because they, of the ability of agents to scaffold them and because it's distributed and they don't all have to remember it, right? Uh, that That's where the complexification of whatever programs you're putting in comes from. And so it's, it's kind of another way of looking at it. And you, you, you can get around the recursion by, uh, because it already has that how occurring and the ability to, um, uh, you know, yeah. stack. I mean, there's, there's uh, some, there's some level of recursion just implicit in the whole, in the whole way it's, it's set up. Yeah. 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 Let's let's hear. I, why, let, yeah, let's I hear want to. I want to have a little. I want to have a little chat here. I appreciate Deborah you spending so much time explaining Sister to me, Sorry. and uh, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna download some of the papers that you've got there, and uh, read about Sister. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I'd like to get back onto the concept of emergence uh, directly dealing with emergence. And I'm one of these believers that uh, you want as much as possible emerging as possible. So I'm really interested in uh, making the most simplest, uh, uh, s simplest level um, of complexity into the deep neural network um, that's possible and still make it work and have it uh, learn everything. So I'm one of those kind of believers, uh, but it puts a hell of a pressure on the G of AGI, and that means general purpose. And if it's going to be general purpose, well, it needs to be general purpose if it has to learn everything. 
Therefore, as we learn uh, anything in any environment, uh, given any configuration of sensors and any configuration of action devices, so really general purpose input, very general purpose output devices. Um, so in Adaptron, you start right down the bottom and you, you, you describe general purpose input devices. So what, what the sensors are and you describe the general purpose output devices. And as soon as you describe those devices, you have sensors which measure something. So you immediately have a value or an intensity and uh, you have multiple sensors in a sense. So you have uh, sensors that are adjacent to each other. So you start getting position information. And uh, from there you can derive size, uh, spatial information and you get temporal information. Uh, you then end up with quantities and so with combination of quantities, intensity, size, distances, uh, etc., you then say, let's emerge, uh, let's combine those pieces of information, those variables or attributes, and, um, and come up with more general uh, or knowledge built out of those fundamental pieces of information. And thus everything tends to emerge, uh, patterns emerge um, and action patterns emerge if you have uh, babbling of some sort on the action devices you have emergent of actions um, and of course combined perception and action you end up with a percep perception action hierarchies um, so i'm one of those kinds of people <laughs> just to start the discussion uh, yeah oh cool and I, I i i started out my agi quest with a very similar mindset and i i still think that is a cool and possible approach to get to AGI, although I've come to conclude it may not be the fastest or best approach to get there. I, 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 I think I think it can work and is, is incredibly interesting. But Alexa, you were going to say something. Yes, uh, uh, maybe I would uh, like to make a slight change of uh, perspective or maybe just uh, argue. Uh, against uh, this uh, approach. Uh, so indeed, it's an uh, interesting question. Uh, what uh, the minimum uh, number of uh, uh, func uh, functions, uh, features, capabilities uh, should uh, an uh, autonomous uh, agent uh, have to uh, learn everything uh, from scratch? Uh, but uh, if we consider this uh, uh, in a slightly more practical way uh, than uh, we uh, apparently we could uh, say let's uh, uh, reproduce the whole uh, evolution on ours uh, but uh, it will be not uh, too efficient so we would like to optimize this a little uh, then uh, we can ask uh, if we want our agent uh, uh, to uh, uh, reproduce uh, all the scientific discoveries uh, made uh, by the entire human race uh, and uh, uh, we wouldn't uh, like uh, do this actually so uh, we uh, most probably would uh, say uh, let this agent uh, learn uh, from uh, uh, books and so on so we already have uh, an uh, enormous uh, code base uh, with uh, all these uh, quick sorts and so on uh, for what reason uh, we need to uh, re uh, uh, to make our agent uh, to reinvent uh, all this uh, stuff from, from scratch and uh, if we uh, accept that uh, uh, it uh, this agent uh, can uh, uh, learn uh, from our books uh, from uh, scientific uh, discoveries uh, uh, the human race uh, uh, has already made uh, from uh, the code uh, human race uh, has uh, al already uh, written uh, in a uh, uh, very large amount, uh, uh, then uh, there, is, uh, there will be not uh, that large difference uh, between emergence and uh, engineering, because uh, is it emergence or engineering if uh, this agent uh, uh, learns uh, category theory uh, from us and uh, then uh, improve on this? Uh, so. The same uh, can be uh, said about uh, the blocks uh, from which uh, this uh, agent uh, is built. Uh, so uh, uh, for what reason uh, should it uh, learn uh, from scratch uh, uh, how to process uh, images uh, by itself? Uh, uh, humans uh, have already done 
uh, their best uh, to train uh, large uh, uh, models on huge uh, data sets like uh, ImageNet. If uh, this agent uh, uh, can do better, then uh, uh, it, it should be able to replace uh, uh, these models uh, uh, by uh, its own model. So uh, if uh, we have already achieved uh, some uh, successes in uh, automation, then uh, it, this automation uh, can be applied. Uh, yeah, so uh, if uh, uh, we can train models which learn better visual features than uh, handcrafted uh, visual features, uh, then okay, let's uh, use uh, uh, these models. If uh, someone uh, can uh, invent uh, an agent uh, which can learn uh, better visual features, then uh, okay, this will be a very large uh, achievement, uh, not only in uh, AGI, but in practical uh, machine vision. Uh, so uh, we can consider this as an uh, engineering emergent process uh, in which uh, the whole uh, uh, humankind is evolved. So uh, we shouldn't consider our agent as a, a standalone agent, uh, which is uh, autonomous, of course, but uh, which uh, uh, exists uh, outside uh, the human race, uh, uh, outside uh, our uh, society, outside our culture, and so on. Uh, and uh, if uh, we consider this, then uh, maybe we can uh, uh, agree that uh, we can uh, uh, compose this agent of uh, our best current achievements. And uh, if uh, uh, it can improve on this, then okay, uh, it can be replaced. So uh, I, uh, of course, I argue against uh, uh, hard limitations, uh, uh, which uh, we can uh, build in uh, this agent. So there should not be such uh, uh, limitations like, uh, uh, I don't know, it uses uh, predicate logic and that's all, uh, of course. But uh, if it can use uh, uh, the already invented uh, tools uh, by humans, they, then why should we uh, restrict uh, this uh, pure uh, lonely uh, agent to, uh, to uh, invent everything uh, from scratch? Yeah, I mean, if, if we think of it in a sort of trivial learning theory context. I mean, every every probabilistic learning system, you know, implicitly or explicitly, that's some prior that, that's guiding its, its inductive and, and ab abductive learning. And, you know, there, there's an argument to make the prior as simple as possible, according to some human intuition regarding simplicity or there there's a direction to make the prior bake in as much as possible of the key parts of human like intelligence since the system is is initially operating in a human like world and needs to needs to interact with us and th this was what was behind Joshua Benjil's paper the consciousness prior that got a bunch of attention a few years ago and my my paper, like many years before that, which I called the embodied communication prior. And I mean, so, yeah, if you're making an agent that's going to live in three dimensional space, if you're making an agent that, you know, doesn't live in around the center of a, around the, the rim of a spinning black hole, but lives in a region where there's sort of one forward moving time axis that it has to worry about. If, if you're making an agent that, is spending a lot of its energy on communicating with other beings that are similar to itself. If you make an agent that lives in the world composed largely of solid objects rather than of, uh, of you know, fluids or gases, like all, uh, and a world that is a hierarchical structure like our physical universe does. So all, all of these are things that you could bake into the prior that biases learning of the system. Or, or there are things that you could ask the system to, to learn, right? And either of those approaches conceptually makes sense. I, I think, I think if you have a probabilistic learning system that's not badly designed, 
you know, then giving it a prior shouldn't make it in principle a less general intelligence because, you know, as long as you're not assigning things probability of zero, then you can always learn something that your prior biases you against. It may just take you a little longer, right? So like the, if, if the human brain were really general intelligence in that sense, if you put us in a five dimensional rather than three dimensional world, you know, you'd be able to say, well, we're, we have a prior assumption of a 3D world. So we will learn things much faster in the 3D world. If you put us in a 5D world, eventually, we will eventually we'll be able to learn whatever we need to learn in, in a 5D world. And what, whether the human brain has that level of flexibility isn't entirely obvious but it's clear one could build an agi system that has that kind of flexibility like you can you can bake in 3d world two ways right you could engineer 3d world really hard coded into your agi into your agi system then it will be fucked in a 5d world or you could code the assumption of 3d world as a prior for the learning system and i mean that th then uh, then it will just learn faster in the 3d world and it will learn but slower how to deal with with a world that violates that that 3d assumption so i think there to me there's two big pitfalls with wiring stuff in which occurred to me from alexi's comments i mean what one one is wiring too much in too rigidly right like you you may need to bake some things in just rigidly into your infrastructure code just because we're implementing stuff on physical machines that may take a long time so like brett may have to code in using a binary neuron instead of a ternary neuron uh, and then if if he has a world that would be more efficiently modeled by networks with ternary neurons then, then it may be less efficiently dealt with like in in adam Ease, we have to wire in some base level programming language in which new programming languages will be will be learned right so wiring too much in like more than you rigidly hard wiring too much in more than you really have to is is going to be a, a a bad thing and the the other the other thing that occurs to me as a pitfall is wiring in crappy versions of human-like biases based on a misunderstanding or oversimplification of how human intelligence works and like so that 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 that, that would be like wiring in crude theories of of how natural language works into a natural language system where the a the problem could be a wiring too much and b the problem is you don't understand how natural language really works anyway so what what you're wiring in isn't actually like you, human language capable right and the the same could be true in current deep neural vision systems like what one issue could be okay you're this system of levels and hierarchy is very very rigid so if you give the system like a higher dimensional world it can't ever deal with it the, the other issue could be it's just an oversimplified version of human vision and human level vision actually needs more feedback from cognition to low level perception than these architectures than these architectures bake in right so there, there's there's a lot of pitfalls there but i think if you if you do the wiring in right you should be encoding everything as biases to your learning system, which doesn't kill your theoretical generality. But then you're you, then you have the question like just how slow, clunky, and awkward is the process of the system updating its own fundamental biases, right? Like for for us humans, in many ways, it's a very slow, clunky, and and awkward process. Like even even overcoming like shallow shallow in a cognitive sense biases about gender and race or something is really 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 hard for for us to do let alone overcoming biases about the dimensionality of the world like we're, we're not so good at it agi systems should in principle be better most current ai systems are a lot worse well uh, first of all i uh, didn't mean uh, uh wiring in uh, in a, a rigid sense but uh, rather uh, providing uh, for our system uh, these uh, models or whatever as tools which uh, uh, it can uh, use uh, when uh, they're useful. 
Well, uh, I, I remember, Alexa, you, you once said that something like the only or most important principle of an AGI is don't assign any hypothesis probability zero. Uh, yes, uh, and uh, 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 that's uh, also what I mentioned, that uh, uh, once uh, uh, we or our system uh, uh, invent uh, something better than uh, we can use it or it can use it and uh, replace uh, the previous version is if uh, uh, our system is designed uh, not too good uh, we just can uh, or it uh, just can uh, design a new better system so my point is uh, that uh, if we don't know how to do something and uh, we don't know how to uh, automate something in uh, the way uh, which uh, will outperform humans, uh, then uh, it uh, uh, may be slightly naive uh, to think that uh, uh, just uh, 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 trying to do it in a, a more general way will uh, uh, help us. So, of course, if uh, uh, we can uh, train a neural network uh, uh, which uh, will work better than uh, handcrafted features, uh, we should do, uh, should do this. If uh, we can do an uh, auto ML or architecture search, uh, uh, which uh, will uh, uh, find uh, better architectures uh, than uh, humans can craft, uh, then of course uh, we should do this. Uh, and uh, uh, if, uh, of course, uh, we need uh, to uh, do research and so on to uh, move forward, uh, but uh, just uh, uh, saying that, okay, let it uh, uh, emerge and uh, uh, do uh, everything by itself, uh, well, it, it will not work uh, this way, uh, unless we know uh, why it uh, uh, sh should do this better than uh, we can do. So if we don't know uh, how to write a good program and uh, uh, we apply uh, genetic algorithms or random search, then uh, it will not help us uh, too much. So uh, there is a trade-off uh, uh, between uh, uh, computational resources uh, uh, we, we use and uh, uh, human resources. So as uh, uh, I mentioned, we don't want uh, to reproduce the whole evolution and uh, uh, it's uh, kind of uh, naive to think that uh, uh, it, it will uh, uh, do by itself much faster as uh, then uh, it was uh, in nature. Well, could, yeah, pure evolution is a very slow process. I mean, yeah, when you get into using probabilistic learning in the, you know, Bayesian optimization algorithm type style, if you, when you get into using probabilistic learning to accelerate evolution then uh maybe we could evolve so faster than nature but then then you have the same agi problems all over again on the level of the probabilistic learning algorithms used to used to accelerate the evolution right but, uh, but yeah not, i mean in in yeah. general i'd say i mean the brain has way more wired into it than than brett's agi systems do which is a is a plus a plus and a minus right i mean Presumably, it gives each of us individuals a head start at learning, and then it causes us to get stuck in, in a lot of ruts also because of the brain, the way the brain embodies these specific assumptions. But evolution is not necessarily teleological. You know, it depends on the specific pressures that are applied to it. And even though generalizability, that's, that's the term we use, there are going to be rather specific actual um, kinds of results, especially for an AGI that most humans will want, especially uh, more than others. So to take the example of, say, sister, I mean, you could have some sort of a market in which you have these intelligent agents and they're progressively specializing by developing these kinds of institutions and they're able to both request and produce code uh, and programs that are more and more specific. But the question is, if you just let that run, uh, and you don't necessarily apply any specific uh, exogenous pressures or demands to it, 
if you just have the market develop in such a way that the agents, you know, endogenously, their utility is satisfied, they're getting the results that they want, they're asking for certain programs, they're getting those programs, but whether or not that's necessarily, uh, whether or not that satisfies the model that the human designers had in mind in terms of AGI can be very different. So it seems as though, you know, if you want generalizability, that's uh, a generalizability that satisfies the actual kinds of outcomes that the designers want, you're probably going to have to guide, I would suspect, you're going to have to guide the emergence quite a bit because you could have, depending on the pressures that are at play, especially if you have this kind of society of mind model where the pressures are being exerted by agents within the model, you know, the, those agents could be perfectly well satisfied without actually giving the human uh, designers what they want. Yeah, I mean, evolution also, I mean, evolutionary algorithms, genetic algorithms are incredibly simplified model of particular aspects of natural evolution and natural evolution is there's a symbiosis and like symbiogenesis aspect and then there's self-organization and autopoiesis and, and all this interoperating with the with evolutionary selection so you have this whole complex self-organizing system and then you this connects back to weaver's open-ended intelligence really where the evolving ecosystem and the society are open-ended intelligences the brain is also an open-ended intelligence so arguably l less so perhaps than the these other examples and uh, i mean current deep neural nets and logic engines are very much not open-ended intelligences <laughs> and open cog would 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 would, li would like to be one so they're but you still from the perspective of trying to build real systems you still have this trade-off between you know, an, an open-ended intelligence system that can grow freely and openly and do everything, which is what Sister is trying to be also, and a system that you can get to do amazing, transformative, useful things uh, within within our within our natural lifetimes, right? <laughs> which uh, evolution evolution did take a did take a long time, right? And uh, and there may be artificial life algorithms already known that if you just let them run four billion years would on a big computer would lead to would, would have led to the emergence of life and 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 some other kind of digital general intelligence right so yeah but ba balancing those aspects is tricky because we don't have any theory to there's not much theory on the practicalities of how long this or that Nonlinear dynamical system will take to lead to the emergence of this or that property under under this or that condition, right? I mean, this this is more like lore and and and, and informal knowledge. So yeah, that I mean, sort of also relates to Alexei's point about uh, okay, we're not trying to get a system to reinvent all of science and human culture and rediscover mathematics that would be interesting but it might end up being a system we couldn't communicate with very well it'd be like an alien system right which would uh, which uh, that kind of system would be more likely to accidentally turn us into computronium not even recognizing that we're intelligent right so i mean but giving it all the books humanity has written to read is it is in a way wiring in, in in some sense a bunch of knowledge just as how all of us have been have been educated by 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 reading stuff but there's still the question of what kind of representational scheme that gets mapped into right so i mean as like a a very high-end example you know, we read physics books on the standard model and general relativity and so on, but we don't have a knowledge representation that was optimized for the standard model and for like a Riemannian geometry, right? We have, 
we we have a sort of meta representation, and then we build internally a model of symmetry groups and Riemannian Riemannian geometry, and because of that extra layer there, that means if someone imposes some new, even kooky or unified physics theory, we can then like build a representational scheme for 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 that, right? So the the meta representational mechanism for learning knowledge representations for new domains of knowledge is not, it's not like strongly conditioned on the contents of the books being read and is, uh, and some level is supposed to have some simplicity to it relative to that, that scope of knowledge. But then whether, whether you need to boil down to the level of simplicity of binary neurons, or whether the level of like modal dependent homotomy type theory is, is is good enough that's a technical question which is interesting to us in this group all of those things are incredibly simple compared to the the scope of all human books ever written or something right. hey one one quick question you know so i mean for instance yes we we're aware that you can write say a program for a cellular automaton uh, that produces, say, universal Turing machines. So you can get universality, uh, albeit inefficient universality, from a simple kind of emergent program. But besides that, I mean, does anyone have an example of um, some sort of demonstrative systemic generalizability uh, that is obtainable from some sort of emergence, well, it, so some it, sort of emergent it, organization? There's two, there's two things that are clear, right? W w w w one is that there's a lot of different methods to get universal learning and universal representational capability. The other thing that's pretty clear is that there is no method to efficiently get like truly general purpose learning and like maximally broad scale ge general generalizability. I mean, there. There's many ways to slice that theorem. I mean, no free lunch theorem is often cited, which is one is one among many, many ways to to formalize that. I mean, it's also it's clear from algorithmic information theory formulations like like Marcus Marcus Hutter has, right? So that then then what your question boils down to is are there examples of some simple looking formalism yielding examples of generalization that are insignificant relative to the scope of all possible things that could be learned mathematically in our known mathematics but but appear significant to humans and in, in, in the scope of what's impressive to us as as as, as generalization like we, like i i was impressed by alpha zero because it could play many different games and learn to play many different games with the same code but I don't think Alpha Zero can take strategic lessons that it learned from Go and apply those strategic lessons to Othello, for example, which is a pretty similar game to Go, but not but significantly different also. So that that would be an example of generalization and transfer learning, like an, an Alpha Zero that could could learn to play all these sorts of games from scratch, but then could transfer abs like strategic knowledge. From one game to another even when the tactical aspects of the games were, were quite different alpha zero to my understanding doesn't do that no one has yet done that i don't i don't think we have seen an example on that level of of impressiveness so so far and now what's what's the most impressive such example that we do have i'm i'm not, I'm not sure of right But wouldn't that just be one of those wonderful hacks <laughs> that um, uh, that you could ev evolve that would be a coincidence uh, because you have selective pressure to be general, well, right? I, mean, I, I don't. I don't think that, so. I don't think Alpha Zero is a is a hack. I mean, of course, there's hacks in any real system, but I, I mean, I think what it's doing is fundamentally cool, although it's not human level AGI, I mean, whether it's a path to there is one is another question. But I mean, the way the way deep reinforcement learning and simulation work together there 
is pretty interesting for problems on the scale of board games and such, which is a very, very different scale than than, than the problems that, that human beings face. But, but so, my wonderful I mean, hat could, yeah. So what, what I wonder is if, if by putting some sort of Occam bias in an alpha zero type system, could you actually coax it to learn stuff in a way that better transfers among games? I mean, that would be, there, there may be some people at DeepMind working on that now, right? I mean, that, 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 would, that would be a cool, a cool example. It would teach you something. I think it's still, I don't know if playing with board games with the limited, comparative limited search space is actually informative toward AGI or not. It, it depends on the way in which you're, you're addressing it, but it's uh, Somehow, the what happens too is that uh, basically learning that the that each position has a value is actually the ultimate uh, way to to think about the game. So what what these algorithms find is uh, that you can trade things as long as you as there is this minimax theorem where you have a minimax value and a maximum value. And in the, under these conditions, it's just, the, both values are the same, and it's just the value of the game. And what you basically have there is that you can trade things for another. Like uh, a good Go player will let you have what you absolutely want to have, but will make you pay a price for it. That is probably more than the than the value of it. So <laughs> the the way this thing uh, works so well is because it actually focuses that. The value of the game is the real thing, more important than the stories we tell ourselves, uh, thinking about uh, chess and saying, well, I have a rook that is pinning this this thing or whatever. Like, that's just the story about our, that we tell ourselves. The, the real thing is the value of the game. And that's what the algorithm gets so well. And that's why it's so stronger than humans, because it, it really, you, you cannot trick him in evaluating the position no it's not about uh, the value of the game uh, checkers uh, has been, uh, have been solved uh, uh, just uh, by using uh, brute force and uh, uh, systems like uh, AlphaGo just uh, played uh, 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 hundreds of uh, millions of games uh, so it's a specialized system uh, which uh, uh, uses a kind of, of uh, br brute force. Uh, uh, of course, it, uh, it's uh, uh, doing uh, slightly more than this, and uh, uh, it uh, interpolates, uh, in, it extracts uh, uh, some uh, useful features, uh, but uh, why humans uh, need uh, to tell uh, themselves such stories uh, uh, is uh, because uh, we cannot uh, physically play uh, this amount of games and these stories uh, can help us uh, uh, to do uh, 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 almost uh, as good as uh, Alpha Zero playing uh, uh, 10,000 uh, times less uh, games. So uh, it's not about uh, uh, value function, it's uh, just about uh, computational resources and specialization. The, the value function is a stochastic value function. I mean, it's M Monte Carlo research. So uh, if you have experience uh, writing Go programs, which I do have, uh, until you get the, the evaluation of the boards perfectly, your program absolutely sucks. So it starts, it's, uh, as you say, exactly, uh, from uh, depending on how much hardware you have, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of games, you get these final positions and once you have so it's a stochastic evaluation function but it is an evaluation function so what uh, the neural networks do in in computer go is giving the right priorities that uh, it's kind of it's a completely different game like uh, being able to predict what a master will do is a complete then it's a completely different game than winning games Sometimes you, you are more sloppy, but you play until the end and the evaluation part of it. The, there was an author who, uh, of, a, of a program called Zen who used two Japanese words for that. It was kankaku and yomi. And yomi is the reading part, kankaku is the feeling. And you have this 
stochastic kankaku uh, that is because you get to the to the end of it and the reading where you have all the casual uh, fights like what if i do this then i do that it's reading a tree so but that's why this uh, because all these games are in the same category that's why you can you can reuse most of the or as in as in the case of alpha zero all the code to, to but but, uh, but if uh, you just uh, change uh, uh, the rules a, a little bit uh, like uh, uh, capture the first stone or uh, get an uh, a specific amount of territory uh, or uh, capture a specific amount of uh, uh, enemy stones than humans, uh, human professionals uh, at least, uh, will be able uh, to play this uh, changed game uh, quite well, while uh, Alpha Zero will not be able to do anything. Yeah, th this comes back to the, uh, <clears throat> the transfer learning point that I was making. Like, so if you if you had a version of Alpha Zero that could do that sort of transfer learning, then that would be interesting and potentially that could be done by giving some sort of uh Occam prior in alpha zero but that would be a big change from how alpha zero is is now i mean it's still it's still a limited domain that can be handled with that whole sort of architecture that's so simulation simulation dependent but uh, that, that came up because james boyd asked for an example of something that was uh, sort of impressively generalizing, sort of thinking how to look at the mix of emergence and engineering and that impressively generalizing thing. And I'm not sure we have that impressively generalizing thing yet, actually. Well, um, the Transformers, um, they, they found that uh, they generalize better when you give them a lot of NLP tasks, right? And so, they, they, because they have selective pressure to generalize, that's how it, it comes to be. And when I say wonderful, but they, hats, but they still I mean, generalize very, very, ba very, very badly, right? I mean, if, if you, if you, not, if you, not across the tasks that there's selective pressure to generalize. And so, why not, you know, have an alpha zero that not only has the um, standard gains, but have them do those standard gains and go at the same time they might find a generalization across that. And the way they would get it is what I call the wonderful hack, meaning they're inside the system, it would discover how to generalize across those games. Uh, it's not a generalization, it's interpolation. Well, yeah, it is. Yeah, but That's why it's not generalization interpolation. I mean, don't we generalize because we have so many tasks? Generalization is not only have, interpolation. No, 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 I, I, don't, I don't think it is. I think... I think you're missing the leap of, ab of, ab of abstraction there. I think like not not yeah. all learning algorithms are. No, I'm saying to abstraction is something there. you discover. It's something you you discover abstraction, and when you do, that's a wonderful you know trick you've learned, or what I call a wonderful hack to that makes it you able to learn many things at once, right? I mean, how was how was the invention of general relativity theory interpolation? I don't really mean it. You could say, <laughs> I'm not the one who said it's really interpolation. I'm just trying to say it's the same kind well, you of. Agreed, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, what I'm trying to say, it's a wonderful hack that it's a a a new way of seeing things that makes it so that you can do all the things you want to do more efficiently. That's what I mean. It is. Yeah, I, I guess I feel like. There's a lot of creativity and a lot of discovery that happens by things I would vaguely describe as as interpolation. But then there there's also some creative leaping that isn't well described as interpolation. And ev evolutionary algorithms are better at that than current deep neural networks, for 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 example. So I mean one critique you could make of things like transformer models is is that is that they are they are basically interpolating in a broad sense i mean they're they're curve fitting right and yeah if you give enough data 
then, okay, I mean, just as Kerr's face recognition algorithms are largely doing that, but you showed them so many faces and the scope of human faces is not that many, right? So then, then okay, interpolating among all the human faces, you gave face plus plus or, or whatever, is fine. That's good enough to do face recognition. And NLP to a certain level is like that also, right? I mean, human language is diverse, but it's still... You know, human language in everyday life is not infinitely diverse if you set aside like new innovations in, in literature or something, right? So then, yeah, you feed everything on the web and then and then you're getting broad coverage by what in the fundamental sense may be very trivial right. method. Right. So no, scientific, dis scientific discovery fundamentally isn't like that, which is why I made right. the example of general relativity, right? Because they're, they're, the success criterion is going fundamentally beyond what was known before right so but right, right. and, and, and it's not in, it's only interpolation in a really really a really really broad sense because you're, you're making paradigm shifts which in in the commonly recognized formalisms the new thing does not appear as a simple combination of the of the previous things it, it may in long hindsight appear as a simple combination of the previous things but that's only with the new representations that the new thing that the new thing right the new thing and, that, that and i think your ability to keep diversity up right but transformers can't transformers can't do that and right, right. Can't do no that they're, they're right? restricted and we've we've purposely restricted them to um and that's part of the hacks that make them that enable them to have a certain amount of Occam generalization, but but they're restricted because of their 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 static architectures. In general, the way we use them now, right? I'm not saying that that if we do not design other transformers that have more flexible architectures, that they won't be able to make those leaps. But there are small leaps within transformers, and those leaps correspond to learning more about language so that you can apply it to all your different problems and those occur in the you know more generalized end of the trip of well of the neural networks right so those those uh those leaps do occur um in uh neural networks when they're more restricted and they're in a sister system or a system that keeps up diversity and sister keeps it up by having new agents come in and which have more neuroplasticity, right? <laughs> um, because it, it, they hold things softly in cultural institutions that enables more um, leaps, intuitive um, advancements. But that is not to say that small leaps don't occur in transformers. I have a, a quick question going back to the debate about go so let's say this is a hypothetical right let's say you had an agent and uh the agent is maybe even you have you have two or you have a group of them and you train them to learn how to master what are called gnomic games so they can play a game but they can also change the rules to the game and if changing the rules to the game is also itself a move right so you can imagine you know you're playing go and then, but then you can change a given rule to go and then you can learn to play it that way. So the question is, if you did that, I mean, you could potentially imagine one, just changing the rules until you have games that no humans have played before. You can also imagine coincidentally changing the <laughs> rules until you end up with a game that actually has, has a name, you know, a, a, a game that, that humans do play. Question is like, would that be an example of would you call that general, not full uh, generalizability, but at least gameplay generalizability? If you had some sort of an agent that with time would be able to uh, play with a certain degree of skill most games because it simply explored the kind of combinatorial space of these different rules. I just shared the link that there is a, a thing called uh, general game playing. Yeah, yeah, and... we're very, very familiar with that. But the but the GGP yeah. algorithms have never like you take a predicate logic description of a game and try to learn how to play the game from those rules. The thing is, the GGP algorithms, as far as I know, never got very far beyond quite trivial, quite trivial games. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, uh, that's why uh, you, you cannot really change the game during the game. It just you're going to play a game that you don't know the rules until the game starts. And then you learn the rules uh, from, from like both players. And by the way, this was also I've never done that, but this was also done with Monte Carlo research. So it's a similar. But yeah, what, what you say is is actually much harder. And that's uh, the same thing uh, Alex said before. You change the game, the, the rules by anything and you have to retrain everything again. So, yeah. It's a narrow domain. It's definitely we are not in AGI yet. They are very smart. They are creative. Like you can use the word creative because of the the, the solutions it finds are amazing. But uh, it's still a very very narrow domain. So it's just the domain of an abstract game, which is a formal, which has a formal definition. All right, I think we are we are over time, and uh, some of us have another uh, meeting now. So I, I think uh, this this has been a fun a fun uh, fun discussion. I'm uh, not surprised we didn't uh, fully resolve the issue, and instead uh, digressed onto a whole bunch of other interesting related issues. But that's uh, that's in, in 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 the nature of conversation. Maybe I'm I'm thinking. At some future point, we can do one of these sessions on uh, just either maybe Debbie do something on sister, I mean, and, and or something on these prebiotic program soup type models like alchemy or, or chem lambda, and that that, that could lead uh, lead to more focused discussions on emergence, which we diverged from a little bit, but I think we, we highlighted the relations between uh, emergence and generalization and learning theory and so on, which is uh, which is also also good. So for for the next uh, session, a couple of weeks from now, we're going to have uh, Jonathan Worrell discuss some of his uh, type theory investigations and how they relate to to AGI. So that should uh, should be a little bit more of a structured session, but I, I think it'll be good to have some uh, some structured and, and some uh, wide open as we explore the explore the uh, the space of AGI related topics. So anyway, that's uh, meeting adjourned. Th thanks everyone for coming. <laughs>